Um, a very uh, happy St. Patrick's Day to um, uh, everybody and uh, welcome to this uh, session on um, the role of um, Japan in Indian Ocean security. My name is um, Brendan Taylor, I'm the head of the Strategic and Defence Studies Centre here at the ANU, working very um, closely with um, uh, Rory Metcalf and, um, and the team and congratulations to, um, to Rory and the team for putting on such a uh, wonderful event. We're going to be looking at um, the role of Japan in Indian Ocean security this morning, um, covering uh, four uh, questions in particular. Firstly, what are Japan's security interests in the Indian Ocean, including energy security? What are the options for involving Japan and other external powers and regional arrangements related to Indian Ocean security? What partnerships and um, what security partnerships is Japan developing in relation to Indian Ocean security? And last but not least, what contributions can Japan make to Indian Ocean security? We're joined by a very distinguished panel to address us um, on these uh, subjects, uh, starting off with um, Mr Nishi, um, the former Vice Minister of Defence for Japan. Mr Nishi, it's a real honour to, uh, to have you here on this, this panel this morning. Uh, followed by an old friend and, and colleague, uh, Dr David Brewster from the National Security College. Uh, Commander uh, Yushigarata from the uh, Japanese Command and Staff College and uh, another um, old friend, um, uh, Dr Anthony Bergen, the Deputy Director of the Australian Strategic Policy Institute. Each of our speakers will speak for, as with yesterday, for 10 to 12 minutes this morning, leaving plenty of time for um, questions and, uh, and discussion. Just a reminder um, that uh, today's session is on the record. So without further ado, I'll invite uh, Mr Nishi to uh, the podium to address you this morning. Please join me in welcoming uh, Mr Nishi. Well, thank you very much. Uh, my speech is rather a short one, uh, but I uh, try to cover the old topics that was indicated on this paper. So uh, the Indian Ocean has been the important route for various type of trade all through history. It was the route between China and the Middle East countries, as well as India, for trade and ancient, in, in ancient days, and was named the Silk Road at Sea. The trade through the route went far to Europe, even today. It is the important route of trade of various issues. For example, it is the important route to transport crude oil to Japan, China, and other Asian countries today from oil-rich Middle East countries. Japan still heavily relies on Middle East countries for crude oil supplies, in spite of experiences of oil crises twice in the past time. Even the Arab Spring did not change the importance of this route. The safety of the route is therefore vital for Asian countries in various ways. Japan, for example, has deployed destroyers and P3s in Djibouti for the anti-piracy operation in the Middle East for the safety of trade in the region. Though the numbers of assault of pirates declined dramatically recently, however, Japan is going to maintain the deployment for the safety of the maritime transport. Would there be any possibility of the Indian Ocean route losing its importance? If it happens, what would be the most serious conditions changing the meaning of the region? There would be two conditions that might change meaning of the route. First, the development of a new route through the Antarctic is under serious study. The route, if the route is to be commercialized, this will be a shorter route between Europe and Northeast Asian countries than the route through the Indian Ocean. It should be noted that the ASEAN market may not enjoy the advantage of, the, of this Antarctic route, adding that there will be cost issue that should, be, uh, that should be considered. Second, due to the production of shale oil, the United States is now able to export crude oil again. Japan will benefit from this new source of crude oil, and this could reduce her dependence on the Middle East. It should be noted, however, again, that Japan will probably continue relying on crude oil from the Middle East to a certain extent. The route would never be meaningless. Each conditions 
is not sufficient to decrease the importance of the Indian Ocean. The combination of these conditions might shift Japan's security concern in the future to a certain extent if it happens. However, we still have to pay, under the current situation, serious attention to the importance of the Indian Ocean for the Japanese security. This invites us to consider how to maintain the current secure status of the Indian Ocean. India has been the predominant power in the Indian Ocean. However, there are growing factors changing the security environment of the region. Pakistan's nuclear capability, Muslim fundamental movements as Taliban and IS, China's growing presence in the Indian Ocean, and the recent nuclear agreement with Iran. I am most interested in China's movement. The Sino-Indian border issue has been unsettled for many years, and the most recent conflict happened in 2013. The more important issue is the growing presence of Chinese Navy in the Indian Ocean. There are occasional port visits of PRA Navy ships to Pakistan, including a type of ships AS, a ship supporting the operation of submarines. This indicates the possibility of PRA Navy submarines operating in the Indian Ocean. Submarines are a delicate issue for assessing the threat factor at sea. Anti-submarine warfare capability requires serious investment of money as well as human resources and training program, programs. It consists of submarines, surface ships, and anti-submarine airplanes and helicopters. It also requires technological advancement and skills of personnel. Japan has developed this capacity since the days of the Imperial Navy. Though there was a time we suspended the effort after the Second World War, we started the effort again after establishing the Maritime Self-Defense Force about half a century ago. The recent Japanese initiative of capacity building transferring software of underwater medicine to the Vietnam Navy is an indication of important first steps of Japan's commitment to the regional security environment. The bilateral military cooperation between Japan and India is still limited. However, Japan's participation to the Marbai exercise is a first important step towards that end together with the Indian participation to the Japanese Fleet Review in 2015. The bilateral talks concerning the sales of US-2, the flying boat, will be the next important bilateral security issue between India and Japan. Japan herself currently faces a difficult situation in the East China Sea. The Japanese maritime self-defense forces has about 50 destroyers. However, almost half of them, half of the on-operation ships are tied to the East China Sea. There are so many objects for the ISR operation in the East China Sea, and most of them are PRA Navy ships. Chinese Declaration of Air Defense Identification Area in East China Sea is another important issue of security concern. Japan perceives that China would like to control the sky and the announced area, almost like its sovereign area. You have to note that the, the concept of the ADIA is a bit different from the ADIZ, Air Defense Identification Zone, which the United States, Japan, and other countries declare already about half a century ago. The long corridor of navigation from Japan to the Middle East is very important for the Japanese security now and its significance would never decrease its meaning in the future. The concept of in the Pacific covers the whole area that is essential for the Japanese prosperity. Australia is the center of the Indo-Pacific concept, and India is the dominant power in the Indian Ocean. Japan has already started her cooperation with these countries for maintaining the peaceful status of this long corridor and would have more occasion to cooperate with India in future.
the development of bilateral relations between Australia and Japan as a good and meaningful guidance for enhancing India-Japan relations, exchange of people, mutual visit of units of services, concluding bilateral agreement of AXA, Acquisition Cross-Service Agreement, and GSOMIA, that is about the agreement of the secu uh, security of the secret information. There is still a lot that Japan can do for the security and safety of the Indian Ocean. Thank you very much. Good morning. Um, Ambassador Kusaka, you spoke yesterday uh, morning about Japan's growing concerns about Indian Ocean security. But indeed, until recently, the Indian Ocean was not really part of uh, Japan's security agenda. For the last 70 years, uh, Japan's security horizons have really not extended too far past Singapore, even if they extended that far. In essence, Japan has largely left its interests in the Indian Ocean to be protected by the US Navy. And while the US Navy remains the uh, predominant security provider in the Indian Ocean, and will continue to be so for the foreseeable future, that approach of entirely uh, relying on the United States is really no longer sustainable. Uh, the United States has made it clear that it is looking for its allies and friends to play a much more active maritime security role right across the Indo-Pacific, and that inevitably includes Japan. Now, yesterday, Ambassador Kusaka and today, um, Mr Nishi, emphasised the importance of Japan's growing relationship uh, with India as a way of safeguarding uh, Japan's strategic interests in the Indian Ocean. And we've also heard a number of times at this conference how uh, Japan and Australia can work together right across the Indo-Pacific. Well, this morning I want to explore some important roles that Japan could play in Indian Ocean security, either alone or in partnership uh, with countries like India and Australia. But first of all, um, you know, the, the fundamental question is, well, why should uh, Japan be interested in Indian Ocean security? And this is why. This is the view of the Indo-Pacific slocks um, from, uh, from Japan. And uh, obviously, uh, and rightly so, Japan's key interests, are, or most immediate interests, are in the East China Sea and South China Sea. But I should also note that even though uh, the, those sort of uh, the fat uh, uh, slocks that you see in yellow um, going through the South China Sea uh, are of most immediate importance. Um, these, uh, the red lines are actually significantly more vulnerable, vulnerable because they point to actually the co a concentration um, of shipping. Um, so as uh, these images like, uh, like this uh, uh, graphically show um, Japan's uh, uh, slocks, Indo-Pacific slocks, do not magically end at Singapore. And um, as we've been talking about, the primary, one of the primary themes of this conference is that you cannot place um, maritime security uh, in the Indo-Pacific Indo-Pacific in neat little boxes. Uh, there is an interdependency right across uh, the littoral. And that means uh, that uh, a country like Japan has to be an active player in security uh, right across uh, that littoral in, in one way or another. <coughs> Uh, now, as most of us know, Japan has been an active contributor to the international fight against piracy in the Western Indian Ocean since 2009, and that's included ongoing deployments of at least two uh, um, Japanese destroyers. But now concerns about Somali piracy are receding, and it's time, uh, in my view, 
for Japan to develop a much more comprehensive strategy in relation um, to the Indian Ocean. And uh, in my view, key objectives of Japan should include increasing its influence within the region, um, hedging its position through creating at least some, some nascent uh, security presence, and just as importantly, providing support for the development of a regional rules-based order, and that's a real weakness um, in the Indian Ocean. So uh, I would like to focus on four key areas in which I see uh, India as potentially playing a greater role um, in the Indian Ocean. One is greater engagement or continuing its trajectory of engagement with certain countries in the Bay of Bengal area. Secondly, supporting emerging regional institutions. Thirdly, maritime capacity building with uh, poorer Indian Ocean island states. And then I'll, I'll just say a few words about the, the, the special role uh, of the Japanese Coast Guard could, could play in all of this. And I should, uh, I should particularly note that all of these things could be, uh, all of these uh, areas could be pushed forward by Japan in partnership um, with regional partners or to some, to in sometimes alone. So I'll, I'll start to talk about these areas uh, in, in order. So uh, in, in my view of any of the sub-regions of the Indian Ocean, Japan quite possibly has the most interests and can play the most effective role in South Asia and the Bay of Bengal. And we've, as I mentioned, we've already heard a lot of comments about Japan's growing relationship with India. But in my view, uh, Japan can and should play a major stabilising role with other countries in the Bay of Bengal area, such as Myanmar, Bangladesh and Sri Lanka. Yesterday, uh, Admiral Akimoto identified the Bay of Bengal as a key strategic area for Japan. And his main point uh, was really uh, as a hedge against a, a blockage of uh, commercial shipping across the, uh, the, the South China Sea, Japan should be preparing uh, at least for the potential of the rerouting of shipping routes um, across the Indian Eastern Ocean through the uh, Indonesian archipelago and then um, outside of the first island chain. If, if there was some contingency where uh, the uh, areas inside the first island chain uh, was, uh, were denied access. Um, I uh, agree with that view, but I think uh, I would also take a broader view that um, uh, Japan uh, can play a very effective regional stabilisation role um, in, uh, in the Bay of Bengal, and in fact it's already doing so. Um, the Japanese aid agency JICA is really playing a very significant role in Myanmar. Um, it's also uh, playing a leading role in terms of developing port infrastructure in Bangladesh, and I suspect that we're going to be seeing um, a, Japan playing a much more active role in Sri Lanka um, in, in years to come. So that's my first uh, suggestion. Um, my, the second area is support for emerging regional institutions. Now, one of the major strategic weaknesses in the Indian Ocean is its weak institutions. Um, although we have groupings such as the Indian Ocean Rim Association and uh, the, the Naval Grouping, Indian Ocean Naval Symposium, they remain very weak and very underfunded. And 
a, a lack of regional institutions, lack of a regional identity um, undermines the ability uh, or capability of Indian Ocean states to work with each other to either provide um, maritime security themselves or, just as importantly, speak with some sort of regional voice towards um, the major extra-regional powers. And this, these weaknesses um, only increase the risk of strategic instability in the region, particularly as we are seeing changes in the balance of power in the Indian Ocean um, in the coming years as the relative predominance of the US Navy falls. And some countries uh, are even considering the scenario of a, um, a wholesale US naval withdrawal from the Persian Gulf. Um, I think we have to see that as a real possibility, perhaps uh, less likely than more likely, but nevertheless a, a real possibility at some time in the future as US uh, dependence on imported oil falls and as the uh, uh, you know, US, the United States suffers its own political um, instability. So Japan, what can Japan do? Japan is already an observer um, to IORA and IONS, but frankly it does not play an active role in, in either organisation. Um, and I believe that Japan could play a much more active role in those organisations and other Indian Ocean regional institutions, um, whether it be financially or just being there and being an active contributor to the discussion. Um, Japan's reputation among Indian Ocean states uh, is seen in very benign terms. It's, being, it's seen as a very positive uh, regional player and has uh, very little or, or no um, historical baggage in the region. Um, so in, I'm suggesting that Japan should use that reputation and resources um, to help build uh, Indian Ocean as a more cohesive region. Um, my third area is, or suggestion, is maritime capacity building among some of the uh, poorer states in the region, particularly the Indian Ocean island states, which tend to be very poor, have very few capabilities and have huge EEZs um, to manage and exploit. Um, now, there's a, a vast um, range of potential ways in which Japan could involve itself uh, with these countries, basically in the area of helping these countries um, exploit their blue economy and properly manage and govern their areas of jurisdiction, of maritime jurisdiction. Now, one area, one uh, potential area is in fishing. Um, many Indian Ocean island states suffer from the effects of illegal or unregulated fishing in their EZs, and in fact, I think I would suggest that for most of these island states, they would uh, uh, see that as their number one um, security problem. Um, in my view, Japan could play an important role in raising its profile uh, in helping to defend uh, their fish stocks in the Indian Ocean from being preyed upon by unscrupulous fishers, particularly from outside the region. Finally, I'd like just to have a, have a few comments about the Japanese Coast Guard. Now, the Japanese Coast Guard really has a key role to play um, in, in um, being at the forefront of Japan's engagement um, right across the region, and we're seeing that currently in the South China Sea in terms of Japan working with, uh, with countries to, to improve their uh, Coast Guard capabilities. And uh, uh, the Japanese Coast Guard could play a similar role with selected countries in the Indian Ocean. We've seen 
uh, the Japanese Coast Guard exercising with the Indian Coast Guard on an annual basis uh, around the Bay of Bengal area or, um, for, I think, 12 or 13 years. So the Co Japanese Coast Guard certainly has the reach and um, it's really probably or, or certainly uh, the, the most highly capable Coast Guard uh, right across the Indo-Pacific region. Um, so I would suggest that the Japanese Coast Guard should play a, a leading role in, in all of this. So I'll finish uh, with my key uh, takeaways. Um, first of all, uh, in my view, um, Japan must pay a lot more attention to developing a, a comprehensive Indian o Ocean strategy with the objective of becoming one of the um, key extra-regional players in the Indian Ocean. For those who argue that there uh, is a danger of strategic overreach um, by Japan um, uh, being active in the Indian Ocean, I would argue that quite correctly the, uh, Japan has a focus on its immediate areas of East China Sea, South China Sea, but it simply cannot afford not to be an important player in the Indian Ocean. Countries like Australia, which has a relatively small navy, um, has long experience in extending our strategic reach uh, right from the Korean Peninsula on, uh, in Northeast Asia to uh, the Gulf of Aden. And uh, Australia well knows that one needs to leverage um, uh, uh, limited assets um, in um, the best way possible through um, husbanding, husbanding um, naval assets when possible and using financial uh, resources, training and various other forms of security engagement. I would suggest that Japan needs to um, uh, you know, uh, do a lot more thinking about how it can leverage its strategic reach as well. So um, the key, uh, my key suggestions are providing maritime security capabilities and infrastructure to countries like Myanmar, Bangladesh and Sri Lanka. Uh, we've seen engagement with Myanmar, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka is a real, is a key country that Japan I think can play a very active role with. Um, supporting emerging, or emerging regional institutions to help build a regional identity, a regional voice and regional capacities in providing maritime security. Capacity building among the smaller Indian Ocean states uh, in selected areas. Uh, and finally, um, the key role of the Japanese Coast Guard and the importance of trying to use white hulls in, um, in providing maritime security right across the Indo-Pacific. Thank you. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Commander Oshirota from Japanese Maritime Service Defense Force Command and Staff College. And I also PhD candidate at National Graduate Institute of Policy Studies in Dokpongi. And uh, last February, I at last passed the comprehensive examination. And principally, I have to concentrate my developing the, my dissertation. But I failed to escape from the boss's order and captured to sent to the captured and sent to the Canberra two days ago. <laughs> so, uh, but, uh, of course, that I, I can receive the very good inspiration and the stimulation through this conference. So anyway, uh, I want to uh, ex express my sincere gratitude uh, for my invitation, uh, such a distinguished conference for the Professor Melkoff, Dr. Bruce, and all members of the uh, National Security College and also National Australian University and the Japanese Embassy. Thank you. So uh, now, so I, I, I move to the, my discussion and uh, my conclusion is very clear and simple, uh, you can see. So Indian Ocean is a vitally important highway, but strategical overextension uh, for the perpetual uh, permanent commitment. That was my conclusion. And uh, 
many of my presentations, I think that overlapping, so with uh, the Vice Minister Nishi and Dr. Brewster, but I am I'm sorry, but I will continue. And this is my discussion on the uh, uh, counter piracy operation. So the Japanese counter piracy operation has uh, started from March 2009, and two destroyers, two P3C, as a quasi permanent deployment in the uh, surrounding the Indian Ocean. So at first, so after the 9/11, uh, Japanese J JMSDF uh, deployed the uh, support forces uh, for the uh, coalition force on the anti-terrorism war, and uh, for the uh, almost uh, all the time uh, the, since the 21st century beginning, and uh, the JMS is always, hope, almost always, so deploying the uh, surface fleets, uh, surface forces uh, surrounding the Indian Ocean. So, so I now assess that this uh, the impact of the deploying the surface forces and the peace receipts. So the if we uh, deploy the surface vessels in the first seas, and uh, we imagine, uh, estimate that uh, low intensive environment, not so high, high intensive, not so counter piracy, that was a peacetime or low intensive situation. So in this situation, so the ships should be required, uh, should require that the helicopter capable and uh, the sufficient payload, the provision of water, fuels, et cetera and C4 infrastructure, infrastructure such as tactical data link and uh, sat satellite communication, and et cetera. So now JMSDF possesses uh, about 41 destroyers, including Aegis and the helicopter carrier, and uh, six more small frigates. Uh, but only 26 of them are uh, appropriate when considering these requirements. And uh, the 26 is that these ones, so please confirm that the gen five and six ones, something. So, and uh, usually surface ships uh, regularly uh, maintenance and repairing. So due to repair and maintenance, around 20 of them, 26, 80 percent of 26 vessels, so surrounding 20, uh, around 20 are in service at the same time, and six of them, six of 20. So the approximately about 30% of the active destroyers are placed under this pressure. This is a very severe burden for the Japanese JMSDF South Fleet. So of course that the, the present uh, deployment forces two destroyers, but in transit two, and more uh, the preparation for the deployment of the two. That uh, I think that all over time, the six destroyers are occupied for this counter piracy operation. So this is also from the, uh, the uh, website of Cabinet Secretary. The, the distance between the oh, uh, Gulf of Aden and Japan is about uh, 6,500 nautical miles. And it takes over three weeks, maybe the 23 or 24 days at 12 knots. So in the way, midway, there are no permanent bases to provide replenishment or repairing, etc. That work. So, and uh, yesterday, some of you uh, argued about uh, China's one belt, one road concept. So, the, I think that the China's situation is almost the same. Okay. So, I think that the, this concept should be discuss, discussed on a political or economic issue, principally. So, and sometimes it, uh, this issue come to be a, a security issue, but. It is, not, it is almost impossible to overcome the military vulnerability in this region, okay? So, in wrap up this, my argument from now, so James, this DSP, called the DSP, Deployment Surface Force Piracy Enforcement, can conduct ad hoc missions on the way and way to and from the Gulf of Aden. Uh, for example, the uh, humanitarian assistance or disaster relief, uh, or by or multilateral exercise as uh, active suasion or political presence or show, or show the flag. This is what uh, it's it enabled. But it is almost unrealistic to e expand forces which were full-time missions in first seas uh, around the Indian Ocean. So, because the MHDF, FDF asset always so, uh, conducting a strategic ISR in the surrounding Japanese territorial water, 
and the East China Sea. And missile defense was uh, some of the various missions. So this phrase is from the Paul Kennedy's rise and fall of British naval mastery. So Paul Kennedy referred from this phrase by a budget Henry Rizel Hart. So the too much burden obligation invited so that's strategical overextension. That is the same situation for the not only Royal Navy, but James Reef. Yeah. So by considering our capability and limitation, not only United States, but also Japan expect much to India as a as Dr. Brewster mentioned, the predominant security provider. So I think that the only India uh, as a regional power uh, can control the Indian, Indian Ocean theater. And potentially, United US Navy can deploy the self-conclusive carrier strike group. Uh, only United US Navy can deploy, the, uh, uh, deploy and conduct a high-intensive conventional war uh, in the first seas. And no, no, no other navies can such an operation. Of course, we can uh, conduct uh, low-intensive or peacetime activities. But only US forces uh, can conduct a high-intensive uh, conventional force, uh, conflict in the first far of the United States. So OK, so then uh, I swing back to the Japanese security context surrounding Japan. So these three phrases are from, uh, referred from the uh, Asia-Pacific Maritime Security uh, Strategy uh, published in the last year from the US Department of Defense. So that this is the context of the maritime domain surrounding Japan. So this is the A, the safeguard the freedom of the sea, and B, deter conflict and coercion. C, may promote adherence to international law and standards. This is, I think, that the very specific uh, items uh, so it's explaining the strategic context uh, surrounding Japan. And now I think, in my opinion, so I will think about the direct impact to high priority for Japan's strategy at uh, once. So this is a core uh, assumption is involved. In the March Polar World, I think that the nuclear deterrence is still effects as in the, as in the uh, Cold War era. And next, so the uh, I think I have, we have to think about the deterrence and the high intensive conventional of war, uh, so, such as the counter anti access era denial strategy. And the uh, United States, our alliance, is, uh, uh, maintains a very simple military strategy in, in the world. So that is called the offensive strategy based on uh, forward deployment and uh, power projection capability, such as a carrier strike group, expedition strike group. So, and to maintain this power projection capability, uh, U.S. blasting up the uh, air battle, or what they call the jam GC, or the third offset strategy, and blah, blah, blah. So, but the, this is a, uh, the alliance's uh, general direction. So, we have to deal with the counter AD strategy, and uh, Japan should establish Japan's air dinner strategy to secure the secure the basis of a power projection capability of US forces. This is the my key concept of the anti uh, counter SAD strategy uh, for the Jap Japan's military, Japanese military strategy, okay? So, and then, and, uh, but so current world, the trend is uh, low level territorial disputes in the East China Sea and South China Sea. This is a trend, phenomena. But this, this is very difficult to deter. Uh, I remember that the, in this situation, so uh, it was the same, similar situation was occurred uh, in the Cold War era. In the Cold War era, uh, static nuclear deterrence effect, and uh, under the, such as escalation rather level, so regional conflict was, and uh, regional conflict level or uh, high intensive conventional wars often occurred. So, uh, such as the Korean Peninsula or Vietnam or Afghanistan, etc. So this is called the stability instability paradox uh, the, uh, uh, proposed by uh, Glenn Snyder in 1960s. So, and uh, applied to the current situation, this Snyder's argument. So, it's uh, if the deterrence is effect in the high conventional war level, so the low intensive territorial dispute be difficult to deter. This is my. Uh, 
uh, understanding of the current situation, security environment of the uh, surrounding Japan. So, and uh, as I mentioned, uh, uh, counter LCD strategy and Japan's area denial strategy, etc. But in the highly sophisticated area denial capability, so the useful asset under the LCD environment is low visibility or underwater, uh, such as a submarine, UAV, or UUV, or a sales aircraft. And so. so the showy South combatant ship or showy carrier vessel, carrier strip, yeah, aircraft carrier cannot survive under the high intensive threat in the HAD environment. So the, we, of course, Indian Ocean is very important. So we have to commit and show the flag and appeal the presence. But such assets, surface combatant ship, cannot utilize in the homeland defense in the surrounding Japan. This is a very controversial situation. This is my understanding. Okay? So I want to wrap up this my argument uh, by ends ways means structure. So to enhancing the Indian Ocean, uh, the Japanese role in the Indian Ocean. So maintaining open and stable sea. This is a phrase from the national security strategy from Japan, and that that situation is fitted as rock, and uh, securing freedom of the seas. And these situations uh, principally uh, provided by the India and potentially the U.S. forces. And so the ways is three phrases. Japan-U.S. alliance is a cornerstone of the security in the Indo-Pacific region. But I think that the resource is not sufficient. So we, we want to enhance the relationship between India, Indian Ocean, and Australia in the Western Pacific. So, and more, India, uh, including friends and allies, what we call like-minded countries in, surround, in this region. This is a way. And means, and once the, uh, at first, uh, we want to make effort for self-help. So utilizing resources uh, efficiently, uh, appearing maritime superiority outside the HAD environment by surface or air assets. And uh, well, for example, the shore action such as freedom navigation operation in the outside the HAD environment. But two, uh, we should be conscious of cost imposition. So we appeal that we have a very many friends and allies, like among countries in the world, in this region. So this, is, uh, this appeal indirectly contributes to the, my, uh, Japan's homeland defense. This is a very important way of thinking. And plus, so friends and allies, so capacity building in some of Asian, ASEAN countries and some of Asia, South Asia countries. So already, Wilson mentioned that uh, I think that the Sri Lanka or Bangladesh is a very important key of the uh, commitment. And uh, of course, Japan has a historical issue uh, surrounding countries, so such as China, Korea, and uh, ASEAN countries. And also, the India is a regional power and has a historical issues surrounding countries, so such as uh, South Asian countries. So there are rooms to coordinate between the how, can, how Japan can co uh, contribute such countries' capacity building. So this is the, uh, one of the important uh, means of the developing the uh, Japanese role. Okay, so I think that uh, for concluding my uh, argument, uh, in the 18th century, between 18th century to the beginning mid of the 20th century, uh, a great game uh, played between the, within the European major powers. But in the 21st century, this is the first time for the human being history, so the very global powers, global, global power, great game occurred again by global powers, global non-European countries. So such a situation, so I think Japanese, uh, Japan have to uh, act, have to be active and uh, to be uh, active by uh, act and strategically. This is my uh, conclusion of my presentation. Thank you so much. Good morning and um, thank you uh, Rory Metcalf and the Security College and also to the Japanese Embassy for the invitation. I'll focus my remarks on the, the question that was given of what contribution Japan can make to broad Indian Ocean security and some of my comments build, uh, complement uh, David Brewster's remarks, but I, I 
think I've got some fresh points to make. I think the Indian Ocean has enormous potential for harnessing blue economy resources. Fisheries, offshore oil and gas, marine-based tourism, maritime industries are all making a significant contribution to the economies of the Indian Ocean states. I think the blue economy concept has the potential to act as a key catalyst for sustainable development and indeed political stability through the Indo-Pacific. Many of the Indian Ocean Rim countries are, as uh, David said, looking to uh, how to consider how to seize opportunities for the, from the blue economy sector for higher growth. Now, Julie Bishop um, launched the concept of the blue economy in Perth in 2014 at the uh, IORA, the Indian Ocean Rim Association meeting in Perth. And of course, uh, Japan, as we've heard, is a, is, is a key dialogue partner in IORA. There's some confusion sometimes, I think, about the blue economy concept. It's not just the traditional maritime industries like fisheries, shipping in ports, but it also includes areas such as aquaculture, renewable energy technologies like wind, wave and tidal, bioproducts, uh, blue uh, carbon se sequestration and desalination. The oceans are likely to become a economic force this century. It's, that'll be driven by key technologies that make it economically viable to tap marine resources and indeed demographic uh, trends that are fueling the demand uh, for food security and alternative sources of minerals and energy. By 2030, two out of every, two out of every three fish on our plates will be farmed, much of it at, from the sea. Offshore wind capacity is forecast to rise tenfold by 2030. There'll be a surge in investment in coastal infrastructure, industry and tourism as we see global migration uh, to coast, uh, cities and coasts. The blue economy idea is all about the sustainable development of the Indian Ocean and indeed that concept is now enshrined in the Iora Economic uh, Declaration. I believe Japan, like Australia, shares a vision for growth in the Indian Ocean region and both of us, both countries, wish to make blue economic activity a key driver for Indian Ocean Rim countries. Japan wishes to promote uh, prosperity and stability in the Indian Ocean to achieve see, and seeks to achieve that through maritime security and safety. Of course, Japan here has real expertise and de demonstrated um, its contribution to ensure, ensuring freedom of navigation through uh, its, um, its contributions to improving uh, navigational uh, safety in the Straits of Malacca. So the blue economy, I think, is really part of a larger traje trajectory of stronger regional cooperation, where J Japan can play a very useful role for the collective benefit of the Indian Ocean by growing the region's economic potential, whilst at the same time safeguarding the health of the ocean itself. This broad goal requires key expertise, deep expertise, in marine scientific research, and that's Japan's, one of Japan's great strengths. So let me just, in my remaining time, give you five examples where I believe Japan can provide, through its ocean industry expertise, uh, great support for developing the blue economy in the Indian Ocean. First, the Indian Ocean states are looking at alternative non-conventional renewable sources of energy. And here it's offshore solar power that's attracting significant interest. Now it so happens that Japan has one of the lar world's largest offshore solar energy uh, projects. I've been there in Kagoshima City. Um, it's expected to supply something like 20 power to 22,000 ho households in, in Kagoshima. Second, while there's been no commercial developments to date, there is still interest in deep seabed mining in the Indian Ocean. 
Now, Japan is a what's called a pioneer investor under the Law of the Sea Convention for deep seabed extraction of manganese nodules. Um, Japan has registered mine sites in the Indian Ocean, and I think um, Japan can uh, assist Indian Ocean countries if that sector, if and when that sector comes on stream. There's also now global interest, global interest in the development of deep water gas hydrate energy reserves, and it's here that Japan is truly at the international leading edge. India and Japan last year carried out a joint survey for gas hydrates using a Japanese drilling ship in the Indian Ocean. Prime Minister Modi has now listed work on gas hydrates among the top 10 potential areas of research for India, given his country's dependence on imported fossil fuels. The Japanese Agency for Marine Earth Sciences and Technology can, I believe, offer great assistance to Indian Ocean Rim countries in the field of ocean sciences. Third area is um, research and development in marine biotechnology. That also is emerging as a promising sector of growth in the Indian Ocean. Out of the total of 677 international claims between 1991 and 2009 of marine gene patents, 90% of those patents are held by just 10 countries. Japan comes in at third place. So again, this is another area I think Japan can work with Indian Ocean uh, countries to realise some of the economic benefits. The fourth area which I would like to spend just more than a minute on is aquaculture. Aquaculture is a key driver for the blue economy in the Indian Ocean, providing food, nutrition and employment opportunities. Now, um, David mentioned capture fisheries, but capture fisheries in the Indian Ocean is significant, as he referred to, overfishing. So the challenges, uh, I think, of food security can be addressed through sustained aquaculture production. It's the fastest growing food production system at 7.5% a year growth over the last 20 years. By 2030, aquaculture is going to make up around 65% of fish protein. If aquaculture practices can be refined through technology, it'll go a long way towards lessening the impact as David pointed out, of illegal, unregulated and unreported fishing, and so help uh, sustainable ocean resources in the Indian Ocean. A regional approach to skills and technology will be important, I believe, to foster aquaculture. Now, Japan has tremendous skills in, in this industry, tremendous skills. Um, it has enormous expertise in developing high-volume feed, that doesn't require uh, on wild fish in, in, uh, inputs. Um, it's got great skill um, in uh, market demand for farm fish through pricing, nutritional content and availability. And while you might think it is an unusual topic, let me just uh, refer to the fact that, and you can go to Dr Google, um, there is that tons of articles on seaweed as the new superfood. Japan is, of course, leading the world um, in the uh, development and marketing of, sea, uh, uh, of seaweed. Now, look, let's be honest, most people aren't going to uh, want to eat uh, a lot of uh, seaweed unless it's secured around our sushi. Um, and I'm not sure most of us would how to prepare seaweed even if we were given it. So, but I do think that Japan, apart from the technology challenges, I think Japan has uh, an enormous uh, ability to, uh, to, to guide Indian Ocean countries on, on the marketing, on the cultural, if you like, the cultural challenges involved uh, in, in the harvesting of, of, of sea vegetables like seaweed and kelp. Um, the final area, uh, let me just note, is um, the digital blue economy. I think we're all increasingly aware of the growing importance of the network of submarine cables um, that uh, provide us with, uh, you know, internet and, and phone access, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and that a key, that's a key area of development too in the Indian Ocean, uh, developing the digital economy, 
um, through, the, through the development of submarine uh, cables. Japan is one of the world's leading providers of undersea cable uh, subsystems. So that's another area I think um, Japan can offer. So in summary, I guess my argument is that I think the Indian Ocean countries um, are realising the importance of the oceans for economic development. And I think Japan, I've picked five areas, uh, uh, but there are others uh, where, where I think Japan, by sharing its ocean industry expertise, its skills, its technologies, can make a very significant contribution to ocean development. Thank you. Thank you very much to um, all our, our presenters for those wonderful um, uh, presentations. Um, we've got about um, uh, 15 minutes before the, um, the morning tea break, so what I suggest we do is take a, a very quick round of four to five questions and then uh, give the remainder of the time to our um, presenters um, one or two minutes um, each to respond. So, um, stuff up the back. Hitoshi Nasu from ANU College of Law. So it seems that the, uh, David uh, was suggesting that the Japan should be taking a more active role. Uh, Indian, Indian Ocean Security, uh, but um, uh, Mr. Shirogata, Shirogata um, um, uh, basically uh, pointed out that they realistically uh, it'd, be, be, it'd be difficult uh, for the Japanese self-defense force uh, um, uh, to play that role, uh, uh, at, at least in the near future, uh, whereas the Anthony was suggesting that there are perhaps otherwise Japan can contribute uh, to the Indian Ocean Security. So I was wondering uh, what might be your view, uh, Mr. Nishi, uh, in terms of um, uh, Japan's future contribution to Indian Ocean security. We have a, a second question. Uh, in the Indian Ocean, I'm wondering if there's a, a useful role that Australian facilities can play, or are we just too far south or not suited in some way, um, whether we're talking about Darwin or whether we're talking about Perth. Uh, and I'm thinking here not just about regular uh, usage of those facilities, but also were there to be a crisis in, say, the South China Sea, uh, would it be of value to Japan to have recourse to those facilities, uh, particularly if it was difficult getting back home? Thank you. Uh, Rory Medcalf, Head of National Security College, and it's, uh, it's, it's a real pleasure to see such a distinguished panel on this session, and Brendan, thank you for moderating this. It's another sign of partnership between uh, SDSC and uh, NSC. My question, um, I guess, is to all of the panellists, but particularly to the Japanese panellists, uh, to, uh, to Mr Nishi and also to uh, Commander Ushirogata, which is about uh, Djibouti and about the Japanese um, <clears throat> presence there. Do you call it a base? Do you call it a facility? Do you call it access? What, um, I would, I'd be interested if each of you could explain what you see as the principal mission of uh, that presence. And what potential do you see for that presence to expand and why? Thank you. I think we'll probably have one, one more question because there's a, a, lot, a lot there. We could probably convene another panel on these, these very good questions, but just one, one more question up there. Uh, Marina Service from the National Security College as well. Apologies. I was uh, particularly struck by the excellence of the four presentations. Thank you very much. <laughs> And my question is to Anthony Berg, and I wanted to thank you for helping us to focus on the positives, given that we've had uh, so many presentations about security risks, but you were focusing on the opportunities. What I wanted to ask you is, what circumstances do you think would need to exist for countries regionally in the Indo-Pacific region to collaborate in a very constructive way to harvest some of those benefits that you've been talking about? Perhaps given that that question was addressed to you, Anthony, we'll give you a, um, a first, uh, first go at um, response. Um, wow. Well, um, look, I concur with, um, I think it was, Dave, it was David that said that um, in the Indian Ocean, the institutions are pretty, pretty weak. Um, you know, the Indian Ocean Rim Association, um, is now making strides. I mean, uh, India chaired it, Australia, now Indonesia, South Africa is the vice chair. So the, it, it, it has going to have, it, it, it has had, and will continue over the next uh, four years to have very strong leadership. So 
I think Iora certainly does have potential to develop some of these areas. And as I said, um, Maria, the um, blue economy uh, concept is enshrined in their declaration. But um, uh, look, I guess what needs to happen is obviously a regional approach um, to, to develop uh, the ocean economy. And um, I think that does come back to David's point. We need to think about ways to, to strengthen uh, those regional institutions. And here, I would definitely argue that Japan has a much bigger role to play as a dialogue partner in Iora. I have visited Mauritius twice and spoken to the Secretary General of Iora. He has personally told me he would welcome uh, a bigger role for uh, the dialogue partners in the, in the association's work. Um, uh, Dr Rifti Muda, I don't know, Rifti's still here? Yes, he and I are in a, in a group called the Indian Ocean Rim uh, Academic Group. So there's no reason why Rifki Japan couldn't join as a dialogue partner our academic group to develop some of the concepts that we've heard this morning. So I think there are um, ways that we can work with, and at, at the moment the only pan-Indian ocean body uh, is, is, is Iora. So I think that would be my focus, to try and, and work to, to strengthen uh, the Iora uh, framework. Thanks, Anthony. Uh, David, did you want to respond to any of the questions? Yeah, I'll, I'll just respond to one question about the sharing of facilities. And I would <coughs> focus less on port facilities, more on air-based uh, facilities. And in particular, I would see the importance of creating a, a shared maritime domain awareness, uh, covering both the Bay of Bengal and South China Sea region. And certainly, there's a lot of scope for countries like Japan, Australia, India and the United States to be working together in, in trying to develop a, a, a regional uh, maritime domain awareness system that could very well include um, uh, cooperation and use of facilities in countries like the Philippines, Singapore, Andaman Islands and even the Cocos Islands. So that's, that's one sort of suggestion in that front. Okay, now I have a response to the, the strategic importance of the power and uh, Darwin and uh, the focus of the milk after question. So, at first, uh, and, uh, several years ago, so the US Secretary of State, Hillary Clinton, mentioned that uh, pivot, Asia pivot. So, I think that it's, uh, if we think about the uh, center of gravity in the East Asia, so I think that in Japan or uh, Ryukyu Island chain is a very strategic importance, choke point. But if we change the uh, I point to the Indian Ocean and in the Pacific and surrounding the Malacca Strait or South Asia. So I think that also strategy, West, West, Western coast of Australia is a strategic importance. I, think I agree with you. So and second, so uh, the importance and the presence of Djibouti. I, in my understanding, I don't know the uh, long-term uh, estimation about uh, how, how Japanese government <laughs> think about uh, uh, maintaining the Djibouti base or not. But, uh, in my understanding, the Djibouti base is uh, very far away from Japan and no infrastructure structure, as I explained in the midway of the Indian Ocean. That was a very large and huge traffic, uh, traffic but no infrastructure. And so. I think that this Djibouti base, is, base is, can maintain and the presence of or stable uh, presence of the India or US forces, military forces, and the stable situation, so we can maintain the Djibouti. So this is a very, very tentative existence. This is my understanding of Djibouti base. Okay. So, Commander Ushiroga has asked me the homework about the Djibouti status. The important point is, uh, yes, it is very far from Japan, but at the same time, this is a very important uh, area for the Japanese contribution for the anti-piracy. Basically, we have two fronts of the anti-piracy operations, one in the Middle East, and one near the Malacca Straits. And the Malacca Straits area is the responsibility or the role of the Coast Guard side. We have a very good division of variable between the MSDF and the Coast Guard. The Djibouti is the MSDF's of, uh, responsibility. And Commander Ushiroga pointed out, it's very far, and it's not easy to communicate there. Uh, logistics line is very long. But that is going to give us 
a good opportunity and challenges mm. to develop relations with Indian oceans, particularly India, to have more relations and military relations. We have some increasing numbers of port visits to the Indian side and also the logistical support from the Indian Navy. Adding that, we have occasions of visiting uh, Gulf states in various ways, and it's a very huge occasion for us to exchange experiences and also the clo closer contact with the American Fifth Fleet. The piracy situation in, in, in the Middle East is, is decreasing. It's like a cat and mouse type of competition. If we are going to decrease our presence there, the numbers of piracy is going to grow up. That is the experience <coughs> we had in the past. So we are going to commit. And uh, actually, there exists the controversy inside of the cabinet, inside of the governing party, whether we should maintain it or not. But I think, and from the uh, defense, uh, Minister of Defense's viewpoint, I think that is the position that we are going to keep for future. It is the necessary occasion for us of the logistical challenge, operational challenge, also the contribution of the multinational coordination of navies. And that is going to give us another opportunity to pay more attention that what kind of uh, capacity building efforts we should extend beyond the ASEAN countries in order to give the good, very good infrastructure or future long distance deployment. And that is another challenge. So there will be a lot of challenges that we are going to face and that is quite meaningful for the Japanese security policy for the future. That's what I think now. That, that brings us right um, to uh, 10 past 11, so thank you very much, uh, Mr Nishi, and to, to all of the, um, the other um, panellists, uh, and thank you once again to the Embassy of Japan and to, um, to Rory, not, not only for, for this particular event, but as you, as you say, another um, opportunity for cooperation. Um, join with me in very warmly um, thanking the, all of the panellists for their wonderful contributions this morning. Thank you.